Section 22 of the Seven Lively Arts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. The Seven Lively Arts by Gilbert Seldes. An Open Letter to the Movie Magnets. Ignorant and Unhappy People. The Lord has brought you into a narrow place, what you would call a tight corner, and you are beginning to feel the pressure. A voice is heard in the land saying that your day is over. The name of the voice is Radio, broadcasting nightly to announce that the unequal struggle between the tired washerwoman and the captions written by or for Mr. Griffith is ended. It is easier to listen than to read and it is long since you have given us anything significant to see. You may say that radio will ruin the movies no more than the movies ruin the theater. The difference is that your foundation is insecure. You are monstrously overcapitalized and monstrously undereducated. The one thing you cannot stand is a series of lean years. You have to keep on going because you have, from the beginning, considered the pictures as a business, not as an entertainment. Perhaps in your desperate straits, you will, for the first time, try to think about the movie, to see it steadily and see it whole. My suggestion to you is that you engage a number of men and women, an archaeologist to unearth the history of the moving picture a mechanical genius to explain the camera and the projector to you, a typical movie fan, if you can find one, and above all, a man of no practical capacity whatever, a theorist. Let these people get to work for you. Do what they tell you to do. You will hardly lose more money than in any other case. If the historian tells you that the pictures you produced in 1910 were better than those you now lose money on, he is worthless to you. But if he fails to tell you that the pictures of 1910 pointed the way to the real right thing and that you have since departed from that way, discharge him as a fool. For that is exactly what has occurred. In your beginnings, you were on the right track. I believe that in those days you still looked at the screen. Ten years later you were too busy looking at or after your bank account. Remember that ten years ago there wasn't a great name in the movies. And then, thinking of your present plight, recall that you deliberately introduced great names and chose Sir Gilbert Parker, Rupert Hughes, and Mrs. Eleanor Glenn. If I may quote an author you haven't filmed, it shall not be forgiven you. Your historian ought to tell you that the moving picture came into being as the result of a series of mechanical developments. Your technician will add the details about the camera and projector. From both, you will learn that you are dealing with movement governed by light. It will be news to you. You seem not to realize the simplest thing about your business. Further, you will learn that everything you need to do must be by these two agencies, movement and light. Counting in movement everything of pace and in light everything which light can make visible to the eye, even if it be an emotion. Do you recall the unnatural splash of white in a street scene in Caligari? It will occur to you that the cutback, the alternating exposition of two concurrent actions, the vision, the dream, are all good, and that the close-up, dearest of all your finds, usually dissociates a face or an object from its moving background and is the most dangerous of expedients. You will learn much from the camera and from what was done with it in the early days. I warn you again, they were not great pictures except for the avenging conscience and, one you didn't make, Cabaria. To each of these, a poet contributed. Peace, Mr. Griffith, the poet in your case was E. A. Poe, and the warrior poet of Fiume contributed the scenario for the second. 
Mr. Griffith contrived in his picture to project both beauty and terror by combining Annabel Lee with the telltale heart. A sure instinct led him to disengage the vast emotion of longing and of lost love through an action of mystery and terror. I think he made a happy ending somehow by having the central portion of his story appear as a dream. How little it mattered since the real emotion came through the story. The picture was projected in a palpable atmosphere. It was felt. After ten years I recall dark masses and ghostly rays of light. And if I may anticipate the end, let me compare it with a picture of 1922, a picturization, as you call it, of Annabel Lee. It was all scenery and captions. It presented a detestable little boy and a pretty little girl doing aesthetic dancing along cliffs by the sea. One almost saw the Ocean View Hotel in the background. Mercilessly, the stanzas appeared on the screen, but nothing was allowed to happen except a vulgar representation of calf love. I cannot bear to describe the disagreeable picture of grief at the end. I do not dare to think what you may now be preparing with a really great poem. The lesson is not merely one of taste. It is a question of knowing the camera, of realizing that you must project emotion by movement and by picture combined. I am trying to trace for you the development of the serious moving picture as a bogus art, and I can't do better than assure you that it was best before it was an art at all. Or I can indicate that slapstick comedy, which you despise, is not bogus, is a real and valuable and delightful entertainment. I believe that you went out west because the perpetual sun of Southern California made taking easy. There you discovered the lost romance of America, its wild west and its pioneer days, its gold rush and its Indians. You had it in your hands, then, to make that past of ours alive. A small written literature and a remnant of oral tradition remained for you to work on. On the whole, you did make a good beginning. You missed fine things, but you caught the simple ones. You presented the material directly, with appropriate sentiment. You relied on melodrama, which was the rightest thing you ever did. Combat and pursuit, the last-minute rescue, were the three items of your best pictures, and your cutting department, carefully alternating the fight between white men and red with a slow starting, distant, approaching, arriving, victorious troops from the garrison appealed properly to our soundest instincts. You went into the bad man period. You began to make an individual soldier, Indian, bandit, pioneer, renegade, the focus of your interest. Still good, because you related him to an active living background. Dear heaven, before you had filmed Bret Hart, you had created legendary heroes of your own. Meanwhile, Mr. Griffith, apparently insatiable, was developing small genre scenes of slum life while he thought of filming the tragic history of the South after the war. Other directors sought other fields, notably that of the serial adventure film. Since they made money for all concerned, you will not be surprised to hear these serials praised. The exploits of Elaine, the whole Pearl White adventure, the 30 minutes of action closing on an impossible and unresolved climax were, of course, infinitely better pictures than your version of Mr. Joseph Conrad's victory, your humorous, your should a wife forgive. They were extremely silly. They worked too closely on a scheme. Getting out of last week's predicament and into next week's can hardly be called a form. But within their limitations, they used the camera for all it was worth. It didn't matter a bit that the perils were preposterous, that the flights and pursuits were all fakes composed by the speed of the projector. You were back in the days of Nick Carter and the Liberty Boys. You hadn't heard of psychology and drama and art. You were developing the camera. You bored us when your effects didn't come off, and I'm afraid amused us a little even when they did. But you were on the right road. There was very little acting in these films and in the Wild West exhibitions. There was a great deal of action. 
I can't recall Pearl White registering a single time. I recall only movement, which was excellent. It was later that your acting developed. Up to this time, you were working with people who hadn't succeeded in or were wholly ignorant of the technique of the stage. They moved before the camera gropingly at first, but gradually developing a technique suited to the camera and to nothing else. I am referring to days so far back that the old biograph films used to be branded with the mark A.B. in a circle, and this mark occurred in the photographed sets to prevent stealing. In those days, your actors and actresses were exceptionally naive and creative. You were on the point of discovering mass and line in the handling of crowds, in the defile of a troop, in the movement of individuals. Mr. Griffith had already discovered that four men running in opposite directions along the design of a figure eight gave the effect of sixteen men, a discovery lightly comparable to that of Velasquez in the crossed spears of the surrender of Breda. You would have done well to continue your experiments with nameless individuals and chaotic masses, but you couldn't. You developed what you called personalities, and after that, actresses. Before the birth of a nation was begun, Mary Pickford had already left Griffith. I have heard that he vowed to make May Marsh a greater actress, as if she weren't one from the start, as if acting mattered, as if Mary Pickford ever could or needed to act. Remember that in The Avenging Conscience, at least four people, Spottiswood Aiken, Henry Walthall, Blanche Sweet, and another I cannot identify, the second villain, played superbly without acting. Conceive your own stupidity in not knowing what Vachel Lindsay discovered, that our Mary was literally the queen of my people, a radiant, lovely, childlike girl, a beautiful figurehead, a symbol of all our sentimentality. Why did you allow her to become an actress? Why is everything associated with her later work so alien to beauty? You did not see her legend forming. You began to advertise her salary. You have, I believe, unconsciously tried to restore her now by giving her the palest role in all literature, that of Marguerite in Faust. You are ten years too late. In the same ten years, Blanche Sweet has almost disappeared, and May Marsh has not arrived. Gishes and Talmages and Swansons and other fatalities have triumphed. You have taken over the stage and the opera. You have filmed Caruso and Al Jolson, too, for all I know. You now have acting and no playing. This is a matter of capital importance, and I am willing to come closer to a definition. Acting is the way of impersonating, of rendering character, of presenting action which is suitable to the stage. It has, in the first place, a specific relation to the size of the stage and to that of the auditorium. It has also a second important relation to the line spoken. Good actors, they are few, will always suit the gesture to the utterance in the sense that their gesture will be on the beat of the words. Failure to know this ruined several of John Barrymore's soliloquies in Hamlet. Neither of these two primary and determinate circumstances affect the moving picture. It should be obvious that if good acting is adapted to the stage, nothing less than a miracle could make it also suitable to the cinema. The same thing is true of opera, which is in a desperate state because it failed to develop a type of representation adapted to musical instead of spoken expression. Opera and the pictures both needed playing, by which I cover other forms of representation, of impersonation, characterization, without identifying them. It is unlikely that opera and pictures require the same kind of playing, but neither of them can bear acting. Chaplin, by the way, is a player, not an actor, although we all think of him as an actor because the distinction is tardily made. I should say that May Marsh, too, was a player in The Birth. So was H. B. Warner in a war play called Shell 49. I am not sure of the figure. 
and there have been others. I have never seen Conrad Veidt or Werner Krauss on the stage. In Caligari, they were players, not actors. Possibly since Krauss is considered the greatest of German actors, he acted so well that he seemed to be playing. But that requires genius, and the Gishes have no genius. The emergence of Mary Pickford and the production of The Birth of a Nation make the years 1911 to 14 the critical time of the movies. Nearly all your absurdities began about this time, including your protest against the word movies as no longer suited to the dignity of your art. From the success of the birth sprang the spectacle film, which was intrinsically all right, and only corrupted Griffith and the pictures because it was unintelligently handled thereafter. From the success of Mary Pickford came the whole tradition of the movie as a genteel intellectual entertainment. The better side is the spectacle and the fact that in 1922, the whole mastery of the spectacular film has passed out of your hands, ought to be sufficient proof that you bungled somewhere. Or, to drive it home, what can you make of the circumstance that one of the very greatest successes in America and abroad was Nanook of the North, a spectacle film to which the producer and the artistic director contributed nothing? for it was a picture of actualities made, according to rumor, in the interests of a fur-trading company. You will reply that my assertions are pure theory. It is true that I have never filmed a scenario in my life, but as a spectator I am the one who is hard-headed and you the theorists. What I and several million others know is that something wrong crept into the spectacle film. We know absolutely that the overblown idea of intolerance was foisted on the simple tale of the mother and the law, and that while single episodes of this stupendous picture were excellent, the whole failed of effect. In the birth, Mr. Griffith had two stories with no perceptible internal relation, but with sufficient personal interest to carry. Even here, not one person in 10,000 saw the significance of the highfalutin title. But after the time of intolerance, Mr. Griffith receded swiftly, and his latest pictures are merely lavish. It is of no significance that Mr. Griffith treats Thomas Burke as though the latter were a great writer instead of a good scenario writer. The pretty fine of Broken Blossoms was so consistent and the fake acting such good fake, that the picture almost succeeded. Everywhere, Mr. Griffith now gives us excesses. Everything is big. The crowds, the effects, the rainstorms, the ice flows, and everything is informed with an overwhelming dignity. He has long ago ceased to create beauty, only beautiful effects, like set pieces in fireworks. And he was the man destined by his curiosity, his honesty, his intelligence to reach the heights of the moving picture. It is a hard thing to say, but it is literally true that something in Mr. Griffith has been corrupted and died, his imagination. Broken Blossoms was a last expiring flicker. Since then, he has constructed well. I understand that his success has been great. I am not denying that Mr. Griffith is the man to do Ben-Hur, but he has imagined nothing on a grand scale, nor has he created anything delicate or fine. People talk of the birth as if the battle scenes were important. They were very good and a credit to Griffith, who directed, and to George Bitzer, who photographed them. The direction of the ride of the Klansmen was better. It had some imagination. And far better still was a moment earlier in the piece when Walthall returned to the shattered Confederate home and May Marsh met him at the door, wearing raw cotton smudged to resemble ermine, brother and sister both pretending that they had forgotten their dead, that they didn't care what happened. And then, for the honors of the scene went to Griffith, not even to the exquisite May Marsh, then there appeared from within the doorway the arm of their mother, and with a gesture of unutterable loveliness, 
It enlaced the boy's shoulders and drew him tenderly into the house. To have omitted the tears, to have shown nothing but the arm in that single curve of beauty, required in those days high imagination. It was the emotional climax of the film. One felt from that moment that the rape and death of the little girl was already understood in the vast suffering sympathy of the mother, so much Mr. Griffith never again accomplished. It was the one moment when he stood beside Chaplin as a creative artist, and it was ten years ago. Of course, if Griffith hasn't come through, there is hardly anything to hope for from the others. Mr. Yentz always beat him in advertised expenditure. Fox was always cheaper and easier and had Annette Kellerman and did the village blacksmith. The logical outcome of Griffithism is in the pictures he didn't make. In When Knighthood Was in Flower and in Robin Hood, neither of which I could sit through. The lavishness of these films is appalling. The camera runs mad in everything but action, which dies a hundred deaths in as many minutes. Of what use are sets by Urban if the action which occurs in them is invisible to the naked eye? The old trick of using a crowd as a background and holding the interest in the individual has been lost. The trick of using the crowd as an individual hasn't been found because we must have our love story. The spectacle film is slowly settling down to the level of the stereopticon slide. Comparison with German films is inevitable. They are as much on the wrong track as we are, and the exception, Caligari, is defective because in a proper attempt to relieve the camera from the burden of recording actuality, the producers gave it the job of recording modern paintings for background. The acting was, however, plain, and the destruction of realism, even if it was accomplished by a questionable expedient, will have much to do with the future of the film. Yet even in the spectacle film, the Germans managed to do something. Passion and deception and the Pharaoh film and the film made out of Sumeran were not lavish. And in the manipulation of material, not of the instrument, where we know much more than they, there came occasionally flashes of the real thing. In deception there was a scene where the courtyard had to be cleared of an angry mob. Every American producer has handled the parallel scene and every one in the same way, centering in the melee between civilians and police. What Lubitsch did was to form a single line of pike staffs and to show a solid mass of crowd. The feeling of hostility was projected in the opposition of line and mass. And slowly the space behind the pike staffs opened. The bright, calm sunlight fell on a wider and widening strip of the courtyard. One was hardly aware of struggle. All one saw was that gradually broadening patch of open, uncontested space in the light. And suddenly, one knew that the courtyard was cleared. One seemed to hear the faint murmur of the crowd outside, and then silence. I am lost in admiration of this simplicity, which involves every correct principle of the aesthetics of the moving picture. The whole thing was done with movement and light. The movement massed, and the light on the open space. That is the true the imaginative camera technique which we failed to develop. The object of that technique is the indirect communication of emotion, indirect because that is the surest way in all the arts of multiplying the degree of intensity. The American spectacle film still communicates a thrill in the direct way of a highwayman with a blackjack. But the American serious film drama communicates not even this. It is at this moment entirely dead, or in other words, wholly bogus. I may be wrong in thinking that our present position develops out of the creation of Mary Pickford as a star. The result is the same. For as soon as the movie became the silent drama, it took upon itself responsibilities. It had to be dignified and artistic. 
It had to have literature and actors and ideals. The simple movie plots no longer sufficed, and stage and novel were called upon to contribute their small share to the success of an art which seriously believed itself to be the consummation of all the arts. The obligation remained to choose only those examples which were suitable to the screen. It was, however, not adaptability which guided the choice, but the great name. Eventually, everything was filmed because what couldn't be adapted could be spoiled. The degree of vandalism passes words, and what completed the ruin was that good novels were spoiled, not to make good films, but to make bad ones. Victory was a vile film, in addition to being a vulgar betrayal of Conrad. Even the good Molnar, with his exciting second-rate play, The Devil, found himself so foully, so disgustingly changed on the screen that the whole idea, not a great one, was lost, and nothing remained but a sentimental vulgarity which had no meaning of its own, quite apart from any meaning of his. In each of these, the elements are the same a psychological development through an action. By corrupting the action, the producers changed the idea. Bad enough in itself, they failed to understand what they were doing and supplied nothing to take the place of what they had destroyed. The actual movies so produced refused to project any consecutive significant action whatsoever. It would be futile to multiply examples, as futile as to note that there have been well-filmed novels and plays. The essential thing is that nearly every picture made recently has borrowed something, usually in the interest of dignity, gentility, refinement, and the picture side. The part, depending upon action before the camera, has gone steadily down. Long subtitles explain everything except the lack of action. Carefully built scenes are settings in which nothing takes place. The climax arrives in the masterpieces of the de Mille school. They are art. They are genteel. They offend nothing except the intelligence. High life in the de Mille manner is not recognizable as decent human society, but it is refined and the picture with it is refined out of existence. Ten years earlier, there was another type of drama, the vamp, in short, and Theta Bara was its divinity. I have little to say in its defense because it was unalterably stupid. I don't say I didn't like it, but it wasn't half so pretentious as the DeMille social drama and not half so vulgar. What it had to say, false or banal or ridiculous, it said entirely with the camera. It appealed to low passions, and it truckled to imitative morality. There was in it a sort of corruption. Yet one could resist that frank ugliness as one can't resist the polite falsehood of the new culture of the movies. It would be easy to exaggerate your failures. Your greatest mistake was a natural one in taking over the realistic theater. You knew that a photograph can reproduce actuality without significantly transposing it, and you assumed that that was the duty of the film. But you forgot that the rhythm of the film was creating something, and that this creation adapted itself entirely to the projection of emotion by means not realistic that in the end the camera was as legitimately an instrument of distortion as of reproduction. You gave us, in short, the pleasure of verification in every detail. The Germans who are largely in the same tradition, they should have known better because their theater knew better, improved the method at times and counted on significant detail. But neither of you gave us the pleasure of recognition. Neither you nor they have taken the first step, except in Caligari, toward giving us the highest degree of pleasure, 
that of escaping actuality and entering into a created world built on its own inherent logic, keeping time in its own rhythm, where we feel ourselves at once strangers and at home. That has been done elsewhere, not in the serious film. I would be glad to temper all of this with praise for Anita Liu's captions and John Emerson's occasionally excellent direction, for George Lone Tucker, for Monte Ketterjohn's flashes of insight into what makes a scenario. I have liked many more films than I have mentioned here, but you are familiar with praise and there remains to say what you have missed. The moving picture, when it became pretentious, when it went upstage and said, Dear God, make me artistic, at the end of its prayers, killed its imagination and forswore its popularity. At your present rate of progress, you will in ten years, if you survive, be no more a popular art than grand opera is. You had in your hands an incalculable instrument to set free the imagination of mankind, and the atrophy of our imaginative lives has only been hastened by you. You had also an instrument of fantasy, and you gave us Marguerite Clark in films no better than the whimsy me school of stage plays. Above all, you had something fresh and clean and new. It was a toy and should have remained a toy, something for our delight. You gave us problem plays beauty you neither understood nor cared for, and although you talked much about art, you never for a moment tried to fathom the secret sources, nor to understand the secret obligations of art. Can you do anything now? I don't know, and I am indifferent to your future, because there is a future for the moving picture with which you will have nothing to do. I do not know if the movie of the future will be popular, and to me, it is the essence of the movie that it should be popular. Perhaps there will be a period of semi-popularity. It will be at this time that you will desert, and then the new picture will arrive without your assistance. For when you and your capitalizations and your publicity go down together, the field will be left free for others. The first cheap film will startle you, but the film will grow less and less expensive. Presently, it will be within the reach of artists, with players instead of actors and actresses, with fresh ideas, among which the idea of making a lot of money may be absent. These artists will give back to the screen the thing you have debauched, imagination. They will create with the camera and not record, and will follow its pulsations instead of attempting to capture the rhythm of actuality. It isn't impossible to recreate exactly the atmosphere of Anderson's I'm a Fool. It isn't impossible, although it may not be desirable, to do studies in psychology. It is possible and desirable to create great epics of American industry and let the machine operate as a character in the play, just as the land of the West itself, as the corn must play its part. The grandiose conceptions of Frank Norris are not beyond the reach of the camera. There are painters willing to work in the medium of the camera and architects and photographers. And novelists, too, I fancy, would find much of interest in the scenario as a new way of expression. There is no end to what we can accomplish. The vulgar prettiness, the absurdities, the ignorances of your films haven't saved you. And although the first steps after you take away your guiding hand may be feeble, although bogus artists and culture hounds may capture the movie for a time. In the end, all will be well. For the movie is the imagination of mankind in action, and you haven't destroyed it yet. End of section 22. Section 23 
of The Seven Lively Arts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Seven Lively Arts by Gilbert Seldes. Section 23. Before a Picture by Picasso. For there are many arts, not among those we conventionally call fine, which seem to me fundamental for living. Havelock Ellis It was my great fortune, just as I was finishing this book, to be taken by a friend to the studio of Pablo Picasso. We had been talking on our way of the lively arts. My companion denied none of their qualities, and agreed violently with my feeling about the bogus, what we called Lucote Puccini. But he held that nothing is more necessary at the moment than the exercise of discrimination, that we must be on our guard lest we forget the major arts, forget even how to appreciate them, if we devote ourselves passionately, as I do, to the lively ones. Had he planned it deliberately, he could not have driven his point home more deeply, for in Picasso's studio we found ourselves, with no more warning than our great admiration, in the presence of a masterpiece. We were not prepared to have an unframed canvas suddenly turn from the wall and to recognize immediately that one more had been added to the small number of the world's greatest works of art. I shall make no effort to describe that painting. It isn't even important to know that I am right in my judgment. The significant and overwhelming thing to me was that I held the work a masterpiece and knew it to be contemporary. It is a pleasure to come upon an accredited masterpiece which preserves its authority to mount the stairs and see the winged victory and know that it is good. But to have the same conviction about something finished a month ago, contemporaneous in every aspect, yet associated with the great tradition of painting, with the indescribable thing we think of as the high seriousness of art, and with a relevance not only to our life, but to life itself, that is a different thing entirely. For, of course, the first effect after one had gone away and begun to be aware of effects, was to make one wonder whether it is worth thinking or writing or feeling about anything else, whether, since the great arts are so capable of being practiced today, it isn't sheer perversity to be satisfied with less, whether praise of the minor arts isn't, at bottom, treachery to the great. I had always believed that there exists no hostility between the two divisions of the arts which are honest, that the real opposition is between them allied and the polished fake. To that position I returned a few days later. It was a fortunate week altogether, for I heard the Sacre du Printemps of Stravinsky the next day, and this tremendous shaking of the forgotten roots of being gave me reassurance. More than that, I am convinced that if one is going to live fully and not shut oneself away from half of civilized existence, one must care for both. It is possible to do well enough with either, and much depends on how one derives pleasure from them. For no one imagines that a pedant or a half-wit enjoying a classic or piece of ragtime is actually getting all that the subject affords. For an intelligent human being knows that one difference between himself and the animals is that he can live in the mind. To him there need be present no conflict between the great arts and the minor. He will see, in the end, that they minister to each other. Most of the great works of art have reference to our time only indirectly, as they and we are related to eternity and we require arts which specifically refer to our moment, which create the image of our lives. There are some twenty workers in literature, music, painting, sculpture, architecture, and the dance who are doing this for us now, 
and doing it in such a manner as to associate our modern existence with that extraordinary march of mankind which we like to call the progress of humanity. It is not enough. In addition to them, in addition, not in place of them, we must have arts which we feel are for ourselves alone, which no one before us could have cared for so much, which no one after us will wholly understand. The picture by Picasso could have been admired by an unprejudiced critic a thousand years ago, and will be a thousand years hence. We require, for nourishment, something fresh and transient. It is this which makes jazz so much the characteristic art of our time, and Jolson a more typical figure than Chaplin, who is also outside of time. There must be ephemera. Let us see to it that they are good. The characteristic of the great arts is high seriousness. It occurs in Mozart and Aristophanes and Rabelais and Moliere as surely as in Aeschylus and Racine. And the essence of the minor arts is high levity, which existed in the Commedia dell'Arte and exists in Chaplin, which you find in the music of Berlin and Kern, not funny in any case. It is a question of exaltation, of carrying a given theme to the high point. The reference in a great work of art is to something more profound, and no trivial theme has ever required or had or been able to bear a high seriousness in treatment. Avoiding the question of creative genius, what impresses us in a work of art is the intensity or the pressure with which the theme, emotion, sentiment, even idea is rendered. Assuming that a blow from the butt of a revolver is not exactly artistic presentation, that effectiveness is not the only criterion, we have the beginning of a criticism of aesthetics. We know that the method does count the creativeness, the construction, the form. We know also that while the part of humanity which is fully civilized will always care for high seriousness, it will be quick to appreciate the high levity of the minor arts. There is no conflict. The battle is only against solemnity, which is not high, against ill-rendered profundity, against the shoddy and the dull. I have allowed myself to catalogue my preferences. It is possible to set the basis of them down in impersonal terms, in propositions. That there is no opposition between the great and the lively arts. That both are opposed in the spirit to the middle or bogus arts. That the bogus arts are easier to appreciate, appeal to low and mixed emotions, and jeopardize the purity of both the great and the minor arts. That, except in a period when the major arts flourish with exceptional vigor, the lively arts are likely to be the most intelligent phenomena of their day. That the lively arts, as they exist in America today, are entertaining, interesting, and important. That with a few exceptions, these same arts are more interesting to the adult cultivated intelligence than most of the things which pass for art in cultured society that there exists a genteel tradition about the arts which has prevented any just appreciation of the popular arts, and that these have therefore missed the corrective criticism given to the serious arts, receiving instead only abuse, that therefore the pretentious intellectual is as much responsible as anyone for what is actually absurd and vulgar in the lively arts that the simple practitioners and simple admirers of the lively arts being uncorrupted by the bogus preserve a sure instinct for what is artistic in America. And now a detour around two of the most disagreeable words in the language, high and lowbrow. Pretense about these words and what they signify makes all understanding of the lively arts impossible. The discomfort and envy which make these words vague, ambiguous, and contemptuous need not concern us, for they represent a real distinction, 
two separate ways of apprehending the world, as if it were palpable to one and visible to the other. In connection with the lively arts, the distinction is clear and involves the third division, for the lively arts are created and admired chiefly by the class known as lowbrows, are patronized and to an extent enjoyed by the highbrows, and are treated as impostors and as contemptible vulgarisms by the middle class, those who invariably are ill at ease in the presence of great art until it has been approved by authority, those whom Dante rejected from heaven and hell alike, who blow neither hot nor cold, the Laodiceans. Be damned to these last and all their tribe. There exists a small number of people who care intensely for the major and the minor arts, and they are always being accused of not caring really for the lively ones of pretending to care or of running away from the ancient wisdom and austere control of Greek architecture or from the intense passion of Dante, the purity of Bach, the great totality of what humankind has created in art. It is claimed, and here the professional lowbrow agrees, that these others cannot care for the lively arts unless they romanticize them and find things in them which aren't there at least not for the real patrons of those arts those who observe them without thinking about them aren't they there these secondary qualities i take for example a sport instead of an art nothing about baseball interests me except the newspaper reports of the games so i speak without prejudice in the days of Babe Ruth, I took the sun in the bleachers once and saw that heavy hitter do exactly what he had to do on his first appearance for the day. A straight, business-like home run, much appreciated by the crowd as any expert well-timed job is appreciated by Americans. The game that day went against the Yankees. They were two runs behind in the ninth, and with two men on base, Ruth came up again. Again, he hit a home run, and the crowd, roaring its joy in victory, exhaled two sighs, for the dramatic quality of the blow and for the lovely spiraling of the ball in its flight over the fence. A beauty, a beauty, you heard the expression a thousand times, and he knows when to hit them. They would have roared, too, if he had hit a single, which, muffed, would have brought in the winning run. But they would not have said a beauty. As far as I am concerned, that is proof enough that the appreciation of aesthetic qualities is universal. It isn't, thank heaven, always put into words. Take as another instance the fame of the Wrath Brothers. They are acrobats who do difficult things, but there are others doing much the same sort of thing without approaching the ruclam of these two. Their appearance of ease is a delight. There is no strain, no swelling muscles, no visible exploitation of strength. The Hellenic philosopher who held that the arrow shot from the bow is never in motion, but at rest from second to second at the succeeding points of its trajectory, might have seen some ancient forerunners to these athletes. For each of their movements, seems at once a sculptured rest and a passage into another pose. And that is precisely the quality which vaudeville and review audiences care for, and in a groping way recognize as distinctive and fine. They may think that Greeks have been candy vendors since the beginning of time, and that Marathon was a race course, but they know what they like. I do not see, therefore, that recognition of these aspects of the gay arts can in any way detract from actual enjoyment. On the contrary, it adds. You see Charlie about to throw a mop. The boss enters. Without breaking the line of his movement, Charlie swoops to the floor and begins to scrub. The first, the essential thing, is the fun in the dramatic turn. But what makes it funny is that there is no jerk no break in the line. The two things are so interwoven that you cannot separate them. And if anyone were actually entirely unconscious of the line, the fun would be lost. It would be ham and bud, 
not Charlie, for such a spectator. The question is only to what degree one can be conscious of it, for I have known intellectuals who so reduced Charlie to angles that the angles no longer made them laugh. They have done the same with Massine and Nieinsky. They have followed the score so closely that they haven't heard the music, and they correspond exactly to the man who bets on the game and doesn't see the play. The life of the mind is supposed to be a terrible burden, ruining all the pleasures of the senses. This idea is carefully supported by mental workers, as they call themselves, and by the brainless. The truth is, of course, that when the mind isn't afflicted by a desire to be superior, it does nothing but multiply all the pleasures, and the intelligent spectator, in all conscience, feels and experiences more than the dull one. To such a spectator, the lively arts have a validity of their own. He cares for them for themselves, and their relation to the other arts does not matter. It is only because the place of the common arts in decent society is always being called into question that the answer needs to be given. I do not suppose that my answer is final, but I feel sure that it must be given, as mine is from the outside. Open footnote. I wrote once, and was properly wrapped over the knuckles for writing, that it wasn't to escape Bach, but to escape Puccini that one played Berlin. Mr. Haviland, whom I have quoted frequently, replied that those who really cared for jazz cared for it, not as an escape from any other art. I had not intended to write an apology. Only since I was replying to the usual attack on the jazz arts, I wanted to indicate that in addition to their primary virtues, they have this great secondary one, that when we are too fed up with bad drawing, bad music, bad acting, and second-rate sentiment, we can be sure of consolidation in the lively arts. Close footnote. It happens that what we call folk music, folk dance, and folk arts, in general, have only a precarious existence among us. The reasons are fairly obvious, and the popular substitutes for these arts are so much under our eyes and in our ears that we fail to recognize them as decent contributions to the richness and intensity of our lives. The result strange as it may appear to devotees of culture, is that our major arts suffer. The poets, painters, composers who withdraw equally from the mainstream of European tradition and from the untraditional natural expressions of America have no sources of strength, no material to work with, no background against which they can see their shadows. They feel themselves disinherited of the future as well as the past. At the same time, the contempt we have for the lively arts hurts them as much as it hurts us. We have all heard of the great artist of the speaking stage who will not lower himself by appearing on the screen. As familiar is the vaudevillian who will call himself an artist and has hankerings for the legit. We have seen good dancers become bad actors, Good black-faced comedians develop alarming tendencies toward singing sentimental ballads in whiskey tenor voices. Good comic strip artists beginning to do bad book illustrations. The step forward is never in the direction of superior work, but toward a more rarefied acclaim. They are like a notable novelist who has for years tried unsuccessfully to write a failure, because he has only one standard of artistic success, popularity, but in reverse. As these artists suffer under a program and try to avoid it by touching the field of the faux bon, their work becomes more and more refined and genteel. The broadness, rough play, vitality, diminish gradually until a sort of drama league seriousness and church sociable good form are both satisfied. And all the more's the pity, for the thinning out of our lives goes on from day to day, and these lively arts are the only things which can keep us hard and robust and gay.
In America, there is no recognized upper class to please, no official academic requirements to meet. The one tradition of gentility is as lethal as all the conventions of European society, and unlike those of Europe, our tradition provides no nourishment for the artist. It is negative all the way through. In spite of gentility, the lively arts have held to something a little richer and gayer than the polite ones. They haven't dared to be frank, for a spurious sense of decency is backed by the police, and this limitation has hurt them. But it has made them sharp and clever by forcing their wit into deeper channels. There still exists a broadness in slapstick comedy and in burlesque, and once in a while vast figures of Rabelaisian comedy occur. For the most part, the lively arts are inhabited by the necessity to provide nice clean fun for the whole family, a regrettable but inevitable penalty for their universal appeal. For myself, I should like to see a touch more of grossness and of license in these arts. It would be a sign that the blood hadn't gone altogether pale, and that we can still roar cheerfully at dirty jokes when they are funny. What Europeans feel about American art is exactly the opposite of what they feel about American life. Our life is energetic, varied, constantly changing. Our art is imitative, anemic, exceptions in both cases being assumed. The explanation is that few Europeans see our lively arts, which are almost secret to us, like the mysteries of a cult. Here the energy of America does break out and finds artistic expression for itself. Here, a wholly unrealistic, imaginative presentation of the way we think and feel is accomplished. No single artist has yet been great enough to do the whole thing. But together, the minor artists of America have created the American art. And if we could, for a moment, stop wanting our artistic expression to be necessarily in the great arts, it will be that, in time, we should gain infinitely. Because, in the first place, the lively arts have never had criticism. The box office is gross. It detects no errors, nor does it sufficiently encourage improvement. Nor does abuse help. There is good professional criticism in journals like Variety, the Billboard, and the moving picture magazines, some of them. But the lively arts can bear the same continuous criticism which we give to the major, and if the criticism itself isn't bogus, there is no reason why these arts should become self-conscious in any pejorative sense. In the second place, the lively arts which require little intellectual effort will more rapidly destroy the bogus than the major arts ever can. The close intimacy between high seriousness and high levity, the thing that brings together the extremes touching at the points of honesty and simplicity and intensity, will act like the convergence of two armies to squeeze out the bogus. And the moment we recognize in the lively arts our actual form of expression, we will derive from them the same satisfaction which people have always derived from an art which was relevant to their existence. The nature of that satisfaction is not easily described. One thing we know of it, that it is pure. And in the extraordinarily confused and chaotic world we live in, we are becoming accustomed to demand one thing, if nothing else, that the elements presented to us, however they are later confounded with others, shall be of the highest degree in their kind of an impeccable purity. End of section 23 End of The Seven Lively Arts by Gilbert Seldes.